Uh, thank you so much for your warm welcome. And it's such a privilege to speak and be with everybody, uh, getting to know some of you over the months in Singapore and uh, really appreciate and respect your faith, uh, your love, and certainly your commitment to God and to one another. And again, what an honor to share with you all. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, I guess, share our screen so that you can see pictures and we can start beginning into our um, our uh, message here, our time here. I'm a little confused, wait a minute, it should be this one. Yes, thank you. Yes, can you all see that? Yes, um, so um, Stephen is right, we've been married for a few years and uh, we're very privileged to share with you this uh, class today. I know we are, our time is, is tight and so we wanna keep to it. Uh, today we're talking about a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And we're going to look at the scriptures and look at some practical things. And I just want to share a little bit more, as uh, Stephen mentioned, um, our, uh, let's see here, I want to my, my screen to move. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Thank you. And that's a picture of us recently this year at a sunrise in Hong Kong. And then... Um, this is our family. As you can see, uh, this was, uh, I think it was Alexa's birthday. Uh, my older son, Brian, is holding the phone, and that's June, our daughter-in-law, and Stephen, the, the one in the yellow shirt there. And our most surprising addition this year has been uh, our uh, grandson, Epaphras, who is actually eight months today. So uh, if you hear any crying in the background, it's because he's waking up from his nap. But uh, we're just so happy that he's around. He's such a joy. It's so incredible to be around him. So, but let's go right into the scriptures, okay? Let's go ahead and look at this uh, scripture here. And it says here that a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. But let's get a little bit of the context of that scripture as we begin. Oh, before we go there, though, I want to talk about a couple of things. We've been asking some people in Hong Kong about what it means to be married together. Mm -hmm. And uh, one uh, young couple, one person said, that, oh, you have to learn how to rein in your emotions. because they're like wild horses. That's interesting. Someone else said, well, you know, marriage to this person is you got to be committed to forgive. You got to learn to forgive a lot. Someone else said to us recently that, you know, don't assume that just because you're together with one another that you always know what the other person is thinking or feeling. You know, it's, it's easy. Well, we're together. I should know, but don't assume that. Still someone else said, well, you know, Sometimes the way to fix things is to have a nice candlelight dinner or go to a nice hotel room. And yet just that one little thing, maybe that ad hoc thing is not really going to solve everything as well. And then there was a, a, a comment by another Christian that I thought was very interesting. And this person said that, and this person been married for quite a few years. And he was a he, he said, hey, I, I feel like I've been married to six different people. Every two years, our whole body, all our cells change. And so I feel like my wife is a totally different person every two years. And I think he means that a little bit jokingly, but also in a real way that, hey, you know, we grow, we change, we are hit by different things as we uh, age. And so we have to keep learning how to know and relate to one another. So as I mentioned before, let's go to the scriptures then. And let's look at this. And let me just get my little slot. Uh, yeah, let me get this person out of the way here because let me get my, let's see here. Yes, thank you. Let's go here. And I'm going to read the scripture in Ecclesiastes 4. It says here, again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead, who had already died are happier than the living. We're still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born and who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. And I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Fools fold their hands and ruin themselves. Better one handful of tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. 
And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. There's a lot of wisdom in that last statement there about how a cord that has three strands is, is strong. But of course, it builds up to this. And looking back at the scripture, I like to reflect on it a little bit before we get into the practicals. And I like to see that, first of all, the person who wrote Ecclesiastes says, you know, we're, we're not the most powerful things going on in the world. In fact, we come home each day from work or we labor in our, at home with our children or in the neighborhood or at work, wherever we are. And there's a lot of power going on. There's a lot of things that are going on. And we often feel like we're small potatoes. And then as we think about what we've done or not done, you know, we feel like, oh, you know, sometimes I just want to make a little more money or I just want to do it a little bit better. But I know that sometimes I'm doing it because I want to look a little better than this person or I want to be keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. You know, we may be driven to some degree by envy. And yet at the same time, when we get home and we carry these feelings in our hearts or we carry them through the day, you know, sometimes we're not content with what we've done or what we've achieved. And, you know, you could be 60 years old like myself and sometimes still feel that way. It's never enough or you've never done quite enough. And so the way that this passage ends here, where it says if two lie down together, they will keep warm. How can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. You know, in this world where we sometimes feel so powerless, or we feel like there's so much other things going on, it's so great to be able to talk with one another and to find that peacefulness and find that joy that only comes from realizing, hey, I just need someone next to me. I just need my wife, she needs me, and we need to share this life together. Um, I think many of us know that story or that analogy where um, if you put a frog in water and you start cooking, you start heating up the water, the frog is not going to figure out that he, it needs to get out. Okay, the frog just stays in there and then he gets used to the water getting warmer and warmer and finally the frog gets cooked and it doesn't even know that it, that it was happening. And I think a lot of times that's what happens to us is that we are that frog in that water that is getting warmer and warmer and warmer and that we're getting cooked without realizing it. And that certainly was me uh, two years ago, almost two years ago. So two years ago, we left hope. And so then, you know, still not being very old, I thought I, I need to do something else. So I, um, I started to teach English because I had a, a certificate in teaching English as a second language. So I decided I wanted to teach English as a second language. And then, so I tried to get a student here. I tried to get a student there and without too much success in the beginning, as all, you know, as all businesses, you know, you start out kind of, kind of slow. But then someone else asked me, oh, can you teach Mandarin? And being a Mandarin speaker, I thought, oh, I can teach Mandarin. And next thing I know, I had a couple of Mandarin uh, uh, students, but then I was still trying to build up my um, English uh, uh, ESL uh, uh, side of the business. And so, so, so it got to a point where, um, uh, as Dan was saying, there's still there's power struggle going on, meaning that I had a lot of desires to really take on more and more students or do more and more and more. But then it was adding stress to my family. It was adding stress to myself. And I did not even realize it. And so, so I remember there was one afternoon in particular, um, I had a couple of back-to-back -back classes. So my English classes were online. And I had a couple of uh, neighbors' kids coming up for uh, their Mandarin classes. And it was a crazy afternoon. I would come out of the living room and do my one Mandarin class and then send that kid home. And then I run back to the bedroom and do my online English class, finish that. And then while I'm finishing that, I hear the doorbell go ding dong. My next uh, Mandarin uh, 
uh, student came up and then I did that class and then I sent her home and then I run back to them my bedroom and did the next uh, English uh, uh, ESL class online. And so it was that was that was one afternoon that was particularly um, challenging. And and in some ways I, I was feeling kind of stressed. But then but then to me, I was like, uh, this is just the way it is, you know. This is this is how you build a business, but then, um, but then I didn't realize how much uh, stress it was adding to my family, and so, um, so, so I think Dan was the one that said, "Hey, you are being cooked." You, Dan was the one that that sort of kind of reminded me or kind of looked at me in a way that was like. This cannot go on forever. Uh, you are adding stress to the rest of us, not to mention that you are stressed. I'm like, but I'm not stressed. I'm not stressed. And so, so, so I think it was very appropriate because Dan's like, okay, get out of the hot water. And verse six was very, very good. It says, uh, better one handful of tranquility than two handfuls of toil and chasing after the wind. So I remember it was one time where during our DP time, I just sort of got very humble. And then I said, okay, Dan, just help me. Help me streamline my business, okay? <laughs> help me figure out, okay, analyze for me what I need to do. Do I need to let go of this? Do I need to take on more of that? And so we were sitting actually in a, um, in a little cafe and we had no pen or no paper and he grabbed a piece of napkin all great ideas come are written on napkins. So he wrote on the napkin, we started you know, analyzing everything. And then finally, at the end of the day, we decided that it was better if I let go of all my Mandarin uh, uh, students and just really focus on uh, teaching English. And so then after that, it was no more of this oppression, no more of this running after you know the wind and chasing after the wind and then you know our lives and our marriage and the stress and the tension has just gotten so much better um but it took dan telling me you are getting cooked in this hot water get out of the hot water and for me getting humble and say okay i need help help me figure this out and so now i am I'm not teaching any Mandarin speak, you know, to any, any uh, Mandarin students, Mandarin uh, to any students, but just really focusing on my English um, uh, side of the business. So, so that was uh, very good, uh, very good for, for me as, a, as his wife and to really get humble and get help. Yeah, and so it, it's, it's a good example, I think, to begin to talk about how much we need each other in our lives. And so, Today we have three practical points. This is leading us, leaning us forward here. And the first point is as we try to build that cord together, as we try to strengthen that cord, do we speak our partner's love language? And uh, I really wanna thank Gary Chapman for all of the great wisdom that uh, I'm gonna share from him in this class or in this workshop, this retreat opening. And you see a chart here on the screen here that talks about the five love languages. I think many of us may be familiar with them where uh, we all kind of have our, our particular way that we really feel loved. For some of us, we love hearing words of affirmation from our spouse or even from other people. For others, we are more in tune with just the physical touch. Some of us, we just love to receive small gifts because it shows a thoughtfulness, a, a care that really comes through that small gift that's given to us. Yet another love language could be that, hey, the way to feel love is to spend quality time together. And then, then finally, the fifth kind of uh, love language is that, hey, I don't want the gift and physical touch is great, but do something for me. Help me do something. Do something that serves me. And then I really feel loved. And if you're like um, a good a friend of mine who, who passed away this past year, Ron Brumley, when I asked him, what is his love language? He said, well, you know, it all works for me. So he's very humble. And uh, they're all good things. But if we're smart, we realize that our wife or our husband has a certain language that really hits them or really speaks to them. And again, my wife is going to share briefly here. OK, so uh, towards the end of last year. Um, OK, so after we left Hope, you know, Dan decided that he was going to pursue a master's uh, degree in missional leadership. And so he started it uh, at the beginning of last year. 
and then he's going through his coursework, writing his papers, and you know, reading all the, the, the really deep, deep books that I don't really understand. Um, and then towards the end of last year, he was just getting a little bit, a little bit annoying. He was kind of complaining a little bit. Well, not a little bit, a lot, actually. <laughs> we talked about this already, so he knows I'm gonna share this. But, um, you know, it, it, it seems like he wasn't happy with anything. And I just thought, I just thought really strange. You know, you say you wanted to, to this will make you happy. So you're, you're studying and this, so why are you not happy? And, you know, and plus that you are, you don't have to worry about cooking. You don't have to worry about cleaning. And, you know, when it's time to eat, just come out to eat. And, you know, and, 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 and we're having our time, you know, uh, uh, you know, we're having our time together. And it's just like, I just couldn't understand what is going on? I'm like, what is wrong with the guy? And then I even challenged him and say, I think you're depressed, or I think you're 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 too complaining, or you know, you're not grateful. And and it seems like everything, like I was, it's like I just couldn't figure out what what was going on with him. And then um, after some deeper talks, I think there was one time he just said, I just need to talk. And so then I felt like I really repented, you know, because I think I'm not the kind of person that really needs to do a lot of, that really needs a lot of deep talks. Um, I, you know, so I, I can go on and on and on. And anyway, so, so we started having really regular, every Monday we would get together and have our, what we call DP time, and where we talk, where we just talk about our past week. And, and then, and it, it was amazing. It's kind of like, it's kind of like he took a pill and everything got better. It's kind of like, it's not like everything, like all the knots got loosened up. And, and then, you know, and then we've been doing that. So ever since the beginning of this year, every single Monday, we've been really faithful to, you know, to, to, to our time together and we, where we talk about the week. And, you know, we still have our ups and downs and there are times where we we'll fight, you know, have arguments during our DP time and, you know, but we, but it's, it's, it's getting, you know, it's, we just keep to it and we just keep at it and it's, it's great, you know? So, so I realized that that was, that was one of his love languages that he really needs that quality time. He really needs mm -hmm. to talk. Well, I don't really need all that talking, but since that's what he needs, let's, you know, let's, let's speak each other's love language. Yeah, she says she doesn't need the talking, but until she does need it. So, but, but I, you know, it, depending on how long you're married, you may be very clear what your wife's love language is, or you may be very clear what love language your husband loves the most. I remember when we were very young in our marriage, not quite two years married. Uh, I, I came from the school where, you know, love is candlelight dinner, ride cards go to a beautiful restaurant, you know, romantic, just the two of you talk, talk and have that kind of thing. And we were doing that in our first year or two of marriage, but it came to our second anniversary close to that time. And I realized that I would try to do that or even write the card or we'd have the candlelight dinner, but it didn't seem to light anything under my wife's fire. It seemed not to quite make things better for some reason. So. I recall one day finally getting humble enough to go to her in the kitchen when she was cooking. And I said, honey, I said, so, hey, what, what is it? What is it that will make you or help you feel loved? And she looked at me and she kind of thought to herself and she said, can you come to the market with me? And I said, Okay. So I remember that day, you know, we, we went to the market, I was carrying the bag and she was buying groceries or whatever. And to me, that was like, wait a minute, that's, that's love for her. That's her love language. And so I have to learn, I've had to learn over time how to speak her love language for her acts of service and quality time, I think are important to her. And so I think I'd shared this before, but I'll share it again. Now the love language has become this. Every week, just about every week, I help clean our bathroom. And you see the, 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 the clean out, the gloves, you see the Clor Clorox, you see the brush. Everything has its use. You've got to use it the way she says you use it, all right? The green thing is only for the sink. The yellow thing is for, it's big enough. You see how big those gloves are? 
And then you have to have the right combination of Clorox and water in your bucket. To me, it's like, okay, I just have to do this because this is what makes her feel loved. And so, amen, that's her language. Another part of her language is, uh, and this is just a photo from the internet, but she loves getting her feet rubbed. And uh, that's not me either because the arm is much hairier than mine. But, but, you know, sometimes at the end of the day, you know, like on the couch or in the bed, we'll just kind of like, I'll just get a chance to rub her feet. And, you know, it's very relaxing. And so that physical touch, I think, over time, if she can tell, you can tell when someone is really rubbing your feet because they want to give or because, oh, you asked. And, you know, I've had to grow. I've had to enjoy doing it and just really just let it be totally for her enjoyment, totally for her toes, for her arches, for whatever it is that she needs at that moment. And so I think that's really important, again, is what is the love language that your husband or your wife really listens to? So that's really the first thing I want to talk about here. The second thing I want to mention here is that, or that we want to mention, is that not only do you have to speak your partner's love language, but you also have to improve your communication. And again, this is from Gary Chapman and also from a married retreat, actually, we heard in Hong Kong a few years ago. And uh, I apologize for this one has only the English thing, but I will go to the next um, slide here where it talks about different levels of communication. And the different levels of communication starts, first of all, with, you know, just what you say in the hallway. You know, you're passing someone in the hallway and say, hey, how are you? And you say, fine. Sometimes through our busy days, that's about all we say to one another. Hey, you know, well, you know, good morning. Yeah, good day. And how are you? And then that's kind of the hallway talk. The second level of communication is what they call reporter, where you're just kind of reporting back things about the facts. Maybe it's as simple as, okay, when do I need to pick up Rebecca after school? Or, uh, you know, what time is dinner going to be tonight? Just the facts, who, what, when. And, you know, that's, that's functional. We need that in our lives. We need to be able to have the facts given to us quickly and uh, efficiently. But if that's all our level of communication is during the day, then we're still lacking. The next level, we get to a little more the intellectual or the cognitive. We get to our opinions. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, as guys, we like to look at politics or sports or whatever, and we'll say, you know, I think that so-and-so is not doing a good job. Or I sure wish that, you know, this leader or that leader would do this. Or what about America? What's going on with those guys over there? We start talking about our opinions. And it gets a little riskier, right? Because you want to make sure the other person agrees with you or not. So it could be politics. It could be Instagram posts. It could be sports. A lot of opinions get tossed around. And that's a little more personal. But again, you want to go to the next level, which is when you start talking about, well, how are you really feeling? What really made you happy today? Or why were you kind of down? You know, my wife was talking about last year, I was, I should be really happy. And then, you know, I was not happy about some things. Okay. Are you talking at an emotional level? And then when you talk at an emotional level, are we giving each other the space to be able to speak freely? You know, I, I've done it so much time as a father, as a husband, you know, sometimes I, I just want to say, don't feel that way, or you don't need to feel that way. And then what happens? I totally shut down the other person because I didn't give her or him the freedom just to be real about how they're feeling. Feelings are not right or wrong. They're just what they are. And so that's another level that we need to get to. But then the top level or the higher level is where there's really loving and genuine truth that comes out. It's where I'm really listening with no agenda. I'm not trying to correct or comfort necessarily. I'm just there to listen, to let the water flow, so to speak. There's a lot of respect. And there's certainly a, a no fear of judgment. There's not a sense that, oh no, if I feel this or say this, that she's gonna laugh or she's gonna smirk or she's gonna correct me or he's gonna you know, tell me that that's not the right thing. You know, there's not that instant correction thing. There's more of a, no, mm -hmm. tell me more. Drawing them out, why, and really listening with a lot of respect. And so this, this, uh, these levels of communication, I think, are, are really, really important. 
And, you know, we talked about, I think my wife talked about the, uh, the coffee uh, that we have. You know, we have developed over time, and I think many of us are familiar with, you know, in our discipling lives of discipleship times or uh, spending time together or a uh, single date or however it is. I know this, I know the thing that really helps me and my wife kind of chuckles a little bit, but I know it really helps her as well is the fact that we have a regular every Monday morning or Monday lunch, we get together and we spend that time and we just are there for one another. Yes, we'll talk about schedule. Yes, we'll talk about uh, this appointment or that. Yes, we'll talk about some need or some financial thing. But even more than that, we will spend the time and try to get involved with each other's hearts. What was the thing about your week that really kind of discouraged you? What was it that hit you? Was it at work? Was it something about your teaching and your students? Or maybe it was some interaction with someone in your ministry? Or maybe something, you know, so what, 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 what discouraged you this week? What was your downtime? And then another part of our car, well, listen to that. I'll listen to her downtime and I'll, I'll share my downtime. And then we'll go the other way and we'll say, well, so what, what was something really happy for you? What was an up thing for you this week? What was a high point? And, you know, you got to probe gently. You got to let it come out gently. She'll share what was that for her and, and I'll share what is it what it is for me as well, and we'll just we'll just talk. We 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 try to get to level five, and uh, it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of listening. It takes a lot of. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Mm. It takes a lot of. Well, wait a minute. When you say that, then I don't want to share anymore. So, oh, I, I I did it again. I'm sorry. And so there's a lot of gentleness. A lot of respect, a lot of listening that has to happen in order for more level five communicating to come together. And, you know, I don't know where you're at in your, your uh, marriage right now. I don't know in your own relationship. Maybe, you've, maybe you're a young married. You're not married very long. You're working on all these levels, you know, and it's not like we're always at five or only at two. It just means that there's a whole range of communication that we can grow in and that we can help each other. And so I think that's super important. So that's our second point, is that how do you improve the communication? Our third point about strengthening these cords, not only do you have to have a, a growing level of communication with one another, not only do you have to speak your partner's love language, but you know it's really important as we walk this journey, because we're all on a journey, and hopefully we're hanging in there with God. We're hanging in there the best way we can. We also have to identify who are really our friends on this journey. You know, you're congregated now together on Zoom and we get together. We get together sometimes on Zoom or in person. And we see a lot of the same faces again and again. And that's all great. And that's all very encouraging. But when you really um, have a challenge or when you really, you know, need help, who really are the people that you turn to? Or when there's really something really exciting and really happy, who is it that you turn to to celebrate with? I'm going to let my wife share here. Um, so here you see three couples. Uh, there's us, of course. And then the couple in the middle are Sunny and Bonnie. And then the ones uh, on the other side of us is uh, they're, uh, Jeff and Suwai. And so Sonny and Bonnie and, uh, and us, we've been, well, actually all, both of these couples, uh, we've been friends for over 30 years. Um, I studied about with CUI and then Bonnie and I became instant friends the moment we met each other. And, you know, they're just, and then for the last couple of years, we've been celebrating um, birthdays together. Um, but then, you know, from time to time, we would also, you know, get together and then, as Dan says, you know, when you get in, when you run into a wall, when you get in trouble, when you can't figure something out, who do you call? Who are your friends that you feel like you can really call on? And so, so I wanted to share about how, uh, on the last point, I shared about how the end of last year, Dan just kind of got into this funk where he, you know, just to me, I was like, what is his problem? You know, it doesn't seem like he can't get, I can't 
you know, get him to be happy about anything. And, and I was just really frustrated. And then one day I just like, I just couldn't stand it anymore. And I just, I called Bonnie. And then I was doing one of those rolling my eyes on the phone kind of thing. And I'm just kind of like, give, you know, getting it all out, you know, like telling Bonnie, oh, he's like this, he's like that, you know, and, you know, and then I, I'm just basically kind of like complaining to Bonnie and just kind of in a way, don't know what to do. And it's just kind of like, what is his problem, you know? And so Bonnie, being the great friend that she, she is, she listened and, you know, she chimes in here and there. And, and then there was one, she said one thing that was really, really profound. And at the moment that when she said it, it didn't hit me, but, I, but it sort of it stayed with me. And I went back and, and, and thought about it some more and it really changed a lot of things. She said, she's, as I was, you know, kind of going on and on and on about what is this guy's problem? Um, she said, well, there must be something, de a deeper need that, he, that is not being fulfilled in Dan. And I'm yeah, yeah, I know, I know, you know, I'm, I'm going on and on. But then that one statement really stayed with me. And I went back and thought about it. And that was before we started having these regular times where we, could, we really talked. And I remember thinking, Oh my gosh, the problem, Dan's problem is me. I am the problem. I realized that I was the problem. I was not fulfilling that emotional need that he had about really talking about just connecting, um, you know, not connecting face to face, connecting heart to heart, connecting emotion to emotion. I was the problem. Oh no. But then, of course, when you're the problem, that's the, that's, that's the bad news and that's the good news because you can <laughs> fix it, right? So that was when I really decided, okay, no matter what, even if I don't feel like I need to, you know, have quality time or deep talks, you know, let me commit to our weekly time together. And so, so I was really grateful. I was really grateful that, you know, Bonnie didn't realize that that, that one statement was the key. Uh, you know, that helped our marriage for the last year. Um, but hey, who are your friends? She's a friend. I called her and God used her and, and, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me through her. Mm. And after being married for 30 years, I still need it. You know, I still need it. I still need someone to come and say, you're the problem. Even if she didn't say that, she didn't say that to me. But that's what we need. We need friends. We need friends to kind of help us uh, share our pains, share our joy, share our, you know, share everything. And being Christians, being in the church, we have that privilege. We're so blessed to have that. Yeah. And I hope you do too. Uh, this past uh, week at a meeting, we had a kind of a Thanksgiving sharing. And the question was, you know, who are you really grateful for? And I, I shared about uh, Jeff and Sonny, especially. And, you know, the years go by and they're not easy. Uh, this past year, um, my father passed away. Uh, and then I had to, uh, uh, I went back to America where he was and it was a, a difficult three weeks of quarantine uh, coming back to Hong Kong. And, you know, through all those times, you know, when you have challenges, when you have feelings, when you have ups and downs, you, you talk to the people that you feel the most support from. And certainly, you know, these guys are not perfect and they're, they're not every, not everything is, you know, always beautiful, but, um, but they are my good friends and I want to be there for them and they're there for me. And I really love how my wife is, feels close and feels supported by the others in the, in the group as well. So really having uh, three, a core of three strands means that you have to have people around you. You need to have friends around you who can share your burdens, can tell you the truth, as my wife said, sometimes we need to hear, and who are just friends to you. And so as we kind of end this time, I, I just want to just mention, and I, I keep saying this because I'm learning this myself, is that all of these things that we talk about, it's not just I know something. You got to practice these things in your life. And so I hope that you'll think about these things. I hope you will wonder and you will know what is the language that you're husband or wife needs you to speak to her in? Is it acts of service? Is it words of affirmation? What is it that you're, what is the language they need to hear from you? And you know, it's, it's like learning a new language. You got to deny yourself. You got to do something. 
you know, I didn't, I wasn't born loving to clean a bathroom, but I know it means something to my wife. And so I want to do it. And I think about her when I do it, you know, how about this? Where, where's your communication at? Are you kind of at the opinion level? And the last time you tried to talk about an emotion, he cut you off or she kind of, you know, was kind of mean to you. What, where are your, your communication levels at? You can improve, you can work on it, but you got to practice it, you know, or, or think about who your friends are. And, you know, I know you have a time of retreat and, and, and I don't know if you're actually together or not, but you have opportunity. We all have opportunity to renew those bonds with not just my wife or husband, but, but with other couples around us, because uh, it's, it's good to know that you have friends and they strengthen those cords as well. And, you know, I think through this time, I hope as you go through the rest of your classes the next day or so and the time together, I hope that the Holy Spirit will be speaking to each one of you. And that you will feel called to grow in some way, to change something, to be different in some way for your wife or your husband. I really pray that the Holy Spirit will guide you as a couple to figure out what it is you need to grow in. Because ultimately, when we talk about three strands, it's not quickly broken. Uh, it is my wife and I. It is my wife and I and God. It is to us together trying our best to walk with God toward where God wants us to go so that we can give more honor and more glory to him. So I hope that today our sharing and, and the scriptures will encourage you, and I hope the questions are helpful. And again, we're very grateful, and uh, may God bless all that we're trying to do in our lives. Thank you so much.